Rob, I met in September or something. In September, it was hot. And um, <laughs> Rob and I went over to the Goldman School for the first time ever. And I've been there. You've been there before. I've never been there before. So, yeah, so we go over there. And, and we sat down and we started talking about this idea for a class and everything, and Rob was very gracious and indulged um, me. I wasn't that gracious. <laughs> you were pretty gracious. I didn't, well, I asked him a lot of very difficult questions. Because I didn't think he could pull this off. And look what happened. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we're, we can still have the, the test case, right? So, um, so, you know, Rob and I discussed this, but what was really interesting was, um, um, what was really interesting to me was, like, uh, in 1996, he covers this in, in huge increase in the numbers of children entering the foster care system. California had over 100,000 children in foster care at the time. And um, now we're down to 55,000, right? So something dramatic has changed. So, you know, um, that was really interesting to me that you guys, you would kind of share that same interest in these issues. So, you know, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering have, have you looked at foster care since then, and what are your thoughts? No, and uh, well, I mean, I left the Chronicle in 1999. I, I'm still, I mean, one of the reasons I, I got involved in this is because I love this story because it's really interesting and nobody covers it. And I realized I worked with a, a woman at the Chronicle named Teresa Moore, who's a graduate of this program who teaches at the University of San Francisco now. And she's a wonderful storyteller, and I'm sort of like a policy weird on the back. And uh, together, we, we, I thought we made a nice team because she would tell stories and I would go after the politicians and try to bite them on the leg. And um, the story had nothing to do, or getting involved with the story had nothing to do with policy or numbers or anything, but the fact that a boy died, a boy drowned, who was in Boston from San Francisco. And my editor asked me to find out in the States I was going to write a report about what happened. And so I sent it, you know, I called up the plaque for the State Department of Social Services, say, hey, this kid's drowned, I'm going to do a report. Right? Yeah, yeah, we'll send it over, we're done. And I said, okay. And so I waited and I'd wait. You know, I like, I'd call them every month, like a year went by. And then meanwhile, they're investigating Los Angeles with Chris Paul and Park, all these things were terrible happening. I finally got my hands on the report, and by that time I knew so much about foster care that the report was almost pointless. Um, and I'd been studying and studying and studying and using legislative analyst reports and department of finance reports and learning about this and meeting some wonderful people at the Youth Law Center, which is a great resource. Um, there's a woman named Carol Schofer there, who's Carol with the E. Um, and uh, Carol and I remained friends. She got a lawyer, some friends of mine, and one in, in Oregon who's there. Um, it's, and so I, I, I believe in this story and this project greatly because of there's so many children involved, and I can't decide which is worse, the state taking their children away or, or, or children staying in, in these awful places. It was most, uh, a story that tears at you from both directions, because mm -hmm. everything is just awful about it. So, um, I don't know where the lights come up. It's, I, I'm still interested in it. I still, I think it's just a monumental failure of the state, and I assume it remains so, for people who know a lot more about it than I do. But you, and you just don't have to scratch very and there are you know, some horrible confidentiality problems here, but um, people will talk to you. They'll just start talking. They can't talk these things. Well, I mean, think that's important. I mean, everybody always is very concerned that they're not going to be able to um, bust through. So everybody says, oh, you're never going to be able to get access to kids or to these stories because, you know, there's all these confidentiality laws. But, I mean, you just mentioned the Youth Law Center. Um, I, mean, you, I mean, I also found one of your old stories that you did that the Youth Law Center had done about um, the lack of face time that social workers were giving to kids, and that that um, that caused a lawsuit, and that that kind of sparked your coverage. But you know, in the briefs, you had access to kids, right? And so, yeah. right. and also, I mean, I always went around. I always went to you know through uh, nonprofits, and I would always get access. I would always get access. So. For you, television people don't do what a station in Sacramento did recently. You know, so KCRA in Sacramento went to the uh, Children's Receiving Home and interviewed. 17 year old on camera, um, <coughs> violated like every confidentiality rule. Um, and they just didn't think about all the implications. A, that there are people out there who might want to know where this kid is if this kid doesn't want to be known where she was. I mean, there's just so many implications about, about that kind of work that could be really, really terrible with, with interviewing. 
and so forth. But, but people like Carol Schofer and her amazing staff can provide kids, they can provide all sorts of voices um, if, if you need them. And they're, they're really careful to know what they're doing. Um, she's great. She's, I mean, she's, you know, she's sort of, you know, a San Francisco Democrat. And when Willie Brown got thrown out as Speaker of the Assembly, she said, "I was terrible. I'm going to lose all my bills." And what's interesting is, I said, "Carol, you have to make new friends." And she made new friends. She found like conservative Republicans from Shasta County who had actually been foster parents, who were, you know, one of them had, you know, you know. And so that it, it, it's, it's an interesting story because it does cross party lines a lot of the time. You can find people. All over the place to involved in the story, which I, I that's another reason I liked it because it didn't fall into the usual Democrat Republican global warming abortion, you know, all the preconceived notions about politics. I mean, that's also a nice thing because for the political implication, you know, for the political side, it's true. I mean, you get both sides on these issues relatively easily. So, you know, if you're if you really are concerned with making something positive happen for kids, it's very easy to make that happen. I mean. Um, it's, it's one of those one places, and it's too bad David Kirk is not here today, but he would talk to us all about, you know, kids first politics and how that all works. But, you know, this, this synergy between media and policy vision um, and children's issues really results in big change, you know, if it's coordinated enough. So, you know, that's, that's also another kind of interesting piece. Yeah, attention spans are short. You know, you just have to keep after the sun. <laughs> <laughs> But it was interesting, when we did the story about San Francisco, the director of social services, uh, he knew he had the worst program in the state, and he wanted to hammer the board of supervisors. So on, you know, your conventional wisdom might think, this guy doesn't want to talk to me. He talks all the time. He really shut up, because he wanted to give us all the ammunition we needed for the story, so he could go back to the board and get more money. And he was pretty smart. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, I don't know where he is today. Uh, so the, you know, the politics, think about the way you know politicians need uh, they need you too, uh, particularly an issue like this, but, which is nobody's right. And, um, I think you know one of the elements about confidentiality you brought up earlier is social workers don't even know the limits of their confidentiality. We're not actually clear on what we can and cannot say. Uh, being supremely biased as a social worker myself. Uh, we definitely understand these issues from our everyday work. We know how big the caseloads are. We understand um, what it could mean to mess up and trip up. And yet, when you have a preponderance of coverage upon the child who dies, as opposed to the one who strives, um, we really face a great problem. And I do think, you know, Daniel's saying solution-based and also success-based. You know, I don't know if there is room in journalism for uh, a, a lot of happy stories, uh, but a couple can filter through. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Special <laughs> waiver will be granted for. <laughs> uh, also, welcome Jill Lumber here. Um, and many of you have been social welfare, and Jill. Uh, she's a professor of social welfare and co director of UC Berkeley Center for Child and Youth Policy. She's co founder of the Cal Independence Follow Network, a program to support UC Berkeley students who have been in foster care, and offering the book Take Me Home, Protecting America's Vulnerable Children and Families. Um, she has expertise in all of the issues that we are going to cover here, and really understands the data, um, really understands the importance of these issues, and has been a mentor of many students in the School of Social Welfare studying just these issues. So, Jill, our, our first question was a little bit about, you know, what, what is the relevance of looking at this now? What, what should we be, as journalists in this room and writers, what should we be looking for? What's of interest to us? Well, there are two questions you just asked. Okay. A double barreled question from a researcher's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the hot topics and why now? Okay. So, the why now is all so because the why now is really an important time. On the one hand, there's no money in the state of California, there's hardly any money in the federal level. There's no money, so why now is sort of a maybe now isn't the time. But why now it is the time because, at least at the state level, there is this confluence of factors that sort of the stars are aligned in a way that they haven't been in many previous years. So for example, when you look at the California State Legislature and you're trying to move policy forward, you need to have somebody who's a champion. You need to have somebody who cares about the topic you're concerned about. And when you look at the historical perspective on child welfare services and foster care, there have been precious few champions. 
Hardly anybody in the state capital knew what a foster child was, cared about foster care, and knew anything about how the system worked for decades and decades and decades. The, the policymakers have to move bills through a particular process and have to go through a human services committee on the assembly side and health and human services on the Senate side. Up until recently, you couldn't get legislators to sit on those committees. They would say, anything but. I don't want to be on that committee that deals with those messy family problems. I don't want to be associated with those negative, messy family problems. Now, people are asking, can I be on the Health and Human Services Committee? Can I be on the Human Services Committee? Because it's been this issue of child welfare has been elevated in a way that it's a win now. And when you get to be, have your name as a legislator associated with the foster care issue, that's a win for you because there's been so much coverage of this, these topics because everybody is starting to get it and they're paying attention. And so that's actually a political sort of coup for you if you get on those committees as opposed to being the, the dreaded committee assignment. So that's important. The other issue is the, the uh, Senate pro tem, Daryl Steinberg, who is the leader of the Senate, is a leader on these issues. And so he cares about these issues. He cares about them deeply, he cares about them passionately. If he had all the money in the world, he would fix all these troubles in a minute. He doesn't, so he has a lot of political and financial constraints he has to attend to. But nevertheless, you've got his ear, you've got his attention, you've got his enthusiasm, you have his heart, you have his soul, you have his staff, you get it? So those are important. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't want to do something else, right? And you've got other people who are lined up behind him who are ready to take leadership positions as well. So you look at Jim Bell from Santa Clara, who is sort of establishing himself as this is my issue, this is the thing that I care about, and I'm going to get a lot of yeses on legislation. So it's not to say that there are 120 members, and this is not everybody's issue, but at least there's some champions up there who really care about these topics and who want to do something about it. So that's, that's where one big political star moment is to our advantage, is that there's a, an audience who wants to listen. The second thing is, I think that, uh, I don't know if you've mentioned the California um, Youth Connection, CYC, yet? Well, you we were talking about elevating the issues. I was wondering when we get the CYC. CYC, yeah. CYC it, is the hottest thing in the world. So CYC, California Youth Connection, is an organization that was established 20 years ago by one woman named Janet Knight, who said, youth who are touched by the system need to affect the system. Youth who experience the system need to be able to have a voice in shaping the system. And so Janet put together CYC as a forum for current and former foster youth to be able to come together, decide what they want to tackle in terms of the legislative agenda, and then take that to the Capitol and try to make change. They are the most influential political entities that I can think of besides the industry. I mean, they get the <laughs> <laughs> they really do. And so they go in groups to state capital and they move bills forward or they stop bills depending upon whether that bill is in their interest or not. And they help legislators shape, shape, shape a story and shape a legislative plan. So using, so, so the time is right to have sort of the political stars aligned, people who want to make a difference, people on the outside, CYC, who are very powerful now and who are well known and who want to find partnerships with media, with policymakers, with social workers to shape the next generation. So the inside is the policy inside is ready for change. The policy outside is ready for change. And then finally, we just passed a bill in California, AB 12, two years ago, which was the biggest thing since, since well, here we just get the social policy? Because this one was good, that was bad. So this is, a, it was a really big, in my opinion, it was a really big policy which will extend foster care for youth who want to stay in foster care voluntarily beyond age 18. And it was a huge political coup, on, and we can talk about that, and I think you do later in some later weeks. But that was a political coup, but it also raised the visibility of these issues. So now, when you talk about foster care in the state capital, everybody knows. Everybody gets it. Not like, there are a few champions. Everybody knows what's going on, and there's no one left who doesn't even get it. Everybody gets it. So that alignment makes this the time for media, social work, and policy to come together and say, let's act on this sort of platform to get some real important work done. I mean, Jill, you just wrote, Jill just wrote an op-ed for uh, mm -hmm. the 
Culture Tribune, which was on January 11th, so it's not that long ago. And it was, you know, and, and Jill starts calling out um, child poverty as a public health disaster, right? And, uh, and, it, and you know, I mean, be, having been a student of foster care, now you can understand covering it. When you were covering it in 96, when those numbers were shooting up, um, it had to look like, you know, the world was coming down. So, you know, you, you kind of mentioned urgency. And so what, you know, you're in, in academia, right? And But you kind of decided to take your way out, right? So, you know, what was your thinking behind that? What was what was the advantage of doing that? Um, I think that a lot of children's issues, and I think a lot of vulnerable family issues, are just under the radar. Most most Americans just don't think about this stuff. Most Americans we're so busy with our lives, we just don't think about um, other very often, and we particularly don't think of the most challenged families in America very often because it's kind of uncomfortable, right? It, it, those disparities are uncomfortable, social distance is uncomfortable, um, it feels overwhelming, what can I do about it? So just one of, one of the many goals I have for my own professional life is to find strategies to elevate visibility and to bring this visibility to all of us so that we all care about it. And I have this maybe naive notion that if we all were to care just a little bit more, then that caring would go an awful long way in solving a lot of these social problems. So, you know, an op-ed is just one sort of small way to, to, to get the conversation started at the dinner table, at the breakfast table, or wherever else. Say, oh my God, I had no idea that one in four children in America is living in poverty. Oh, that's kind of a long What does that mean? What does that mean? That, that means that I just, um, so I think that op-eds are one strategy to use to begin a conversation, and hopefully the conversation then sparks action. You know, it's a question just kind of from the journalist side where, um, you know, we're talking about access, and it, you can get a lot of data from uh, a variety of sources, and you can um, read it and look through it and, and really endeavor to see what the picture is telling you. And then you go to social workers in the field, and you also get a pretty good picture. You go to the kids and you get even maybe another level of a clear picture. I think we often skip social workers as sources in the media. And I wonder, you know, is that is that is that the social workers' resistance or is that the belief that what you really need is in front directly the, the mouth of the child? Um, is there room for social workers to kind of be a voice and I thought them? so. Yeah, okay. we we did a we we didn't do as many profiles of social workers as we wanted to when we did that. But I just remember the, the we, one of them was the best one we did was an emergency response for San Francisco, and she must have been about four feet six, and and she was the toughest person I I, I think I, I think I've ever met. And she would go in these impossible situations, and she, I said, "Do you ever take a cop?" She said, "A cop?" She said, "You kidding? Why would I do that?" And she, and she said, "Don't tell my husband what I did." Which <laughs> I thought was the most telling thing about what, how dangerous her work was. She didn't want her own husband to know what her day was like. Um, no, I thought they were, they were great sources. We, we talked to lots of social workers. They were really helpful. Um, I mean, they were kind of, they, we didn't know all that many to start with, and we were kind of in a bind because we were writing what they perceived as something that's critical to the department, so they didn't want to be out there too much um, for, for whatever reasons. But you know, when we had the department director saying this, it was kind of okay. Um, yeah, I would have, we wanted to do more social worker stuff, and we just, we kind of, I don't know, we got, we got <coughs> kind of ran out of steam when we were other things. Lots of other things going on. Right, I mean, I can imagine a lot of um, pretty serious consequences of speaking out against a department that you're working in. Yeah, I, and we, we weren't as interested in, you know, I mean, it becomes sort of a bureaucratic story. We want to just tell people what, what the life of, you know, the daily life of social right. workers like, which, you know, I thought was terrifying. Right. In, in these incredible situations. So uh, that's what we want to look at. Yeah, and I know Jill um, knows as well is it is, as social workers, one of our goals is to kind of bring visibility to the populations we serve. And yet, the minute you're in the field, um, actually doing this work every day, you don't have time, and you also feel protected. Uh, is this a story I want to tell? Is this going to make people feel um, that 
things are far worse? Is this going to create prejudice instead of create um, more understanding? And so I think, I don't know what your experience show, but I think definitely there's a lot of reluctance to writing anything except for empirical research um, and you know, being able to tell the story through the facts instead of necessarily for our own experiences. I think these are hard stories to tell. And I think that that's part of the, we were talking about the politics of this earlier. I think the, the kids' piece is a win, but I'm going to be honest with you, the family piece isn't a win. Yeah. And that's, that's hard. And so, I don't understand. Um, it's really easy to get both political support and, and public <coughs> empathy for the plight of children or youth who have been, who have been maltreated by their caregivers. We all feel that's an injustice, and we all feel a need to respond to that. And um, the problem is that these kids are nested in families, and they're nested in families who love them. People who maltreat their kids love their kids, and they love them very profoundly. And but they make very serious mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes are life-altering, and sometimes they're life-ending. But they love their kids, and they make terrible mistakes. And our, our public empathy for those, and those mistakes is much more limited than our public empathy for the children who are who are the recipients of criminal treatment. So managing that story in a way that gets you to a solution is a hard thing to manage. I mean, I think what's, the, what's the fine line between love and maltreatment? In this, you know what I mean? In the sense of saying these people are hurting or doing bad things to their kids, but oh, I love you. You know, it's like that. I don't know, Argentina, you know, hating her. Oh, I love you, you know what I mean? But it wasn't necessarily love. It was just beating her, you know? So, I, I mean, where do you draw that line? Or how can you, as a social worker or as an onlooker, I mean, what, how do we evaluate that as a viewer? Oh, he beat her, but I just know that she loved her child. You know what I mean? How do you engage in that? Is that the journalist's fault for not going deeper, or? Well, and that's, I mean, that's a really interesting question to anybody. I mean, really, you've got social workers here, too, all over the place. So that's the beauty of this class, is everybody can hop in. But, you know, we're, we're going to have some folks at your emergency response, the woman who runs emergency response down in L.A. County. And, you know, we went out with them in the middle of the night. And how do you make that determination of what is culturally normal, what is abuse, what is going too far, and there's that line, you know, it's, it's, and that's what the, you know, kind of what Jill's talking about too, the level of empathy for um, the families in these situations. You need to understand these things in such a deep level of nuance, and somehow keep your mind open to that nuance, that it becomes very difficult. But I think that clearly, I've been guilty as a journalist too, of writing stories that cast um, an incomplete picture of what was happening. So I mean, I think that there are, people try to systematize it with computer programs, like this thing about strategic decision making. So depending on levels of fear and levels of, of you know, risk, you're gonna remove a child from their biological home or not. So I think, you know, there are people trying to systematize this stuff, but it really takes a lot of heart. So that's why it's kind of a story that requires so much work to tell. I guess, you just brought up a point, I think that as a journalist that I'm kind of coming across when we're talking about this subject, as a journalist, how do you deal with that thin line between writing as an advocate versus I'm um, covering this as a journalist? And in a sense, I guess, since you work, both you work as a journalist, how do you overcome that? And that's totally subjective, too. So like, the line is so different for you as somebody else. I mean, I don't know if it's in this world. I just, <laughs> dealing with it every day by day, we see what the facts of the story were, and the, the, which I just thought were so compelling. And it, it's true, there was this whole other side of, of, of the kids' lives, and I couldn't, but that was, in a way, was outside the purview of what my story was about, which was the department and how it dealt with the kids. Um, and, but one of the things I kept bearing in mind was, I mean, I, I, as I said, when I first started my talking, that I, I'm sort of torn between what I think is the evil of the government taking their children away and then the evil of staying in this abusive environment. And and I know that I've seen it happen so many times when, when we would write about this, that the reaction from the department is, you know, I mean, a, a kid dies or is probably injured, and all of a sudden they're taking everybody 
away because you know no parent is fit, and, and I don't want to live with that responsibility. And then you know on the other hand, I don't want to leave a kid in danger. I I, I don't know. You, you just keep sort of doing it day by day, just trying to be as fair as you can about it. I, I don't really have a. There's no formula for that. But I, I also think this advocacy question is a good one, and I think it's good that you bring it up day one because you know I think that. You, you know, like for instance, the title of this course is a little bit heretical. If you say journalism for social change, I mean, it's supposed to be journalism for social stasis or social watching or, you know, or just reporting completely <laughs> agnostic. But really, you know, well, I mean, anyway, we can get into this, this, this argument. But it's not an argument. But I mean, I'm sure it's not an argument. No, I, if we can't stand. If we can't come here and be for protecting children and advocating for that, what the hell's the point? Well, I agree with you. Well, that's, that's the question. That's the so, question. So, I mean, we all agree on that, right? right. Is there anybody who disagrees? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I, and we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to do that. But okay, so, so this, is, this is the distinction, because I think that it's easy to cast aspersions if somebody looks at you under this auspices of pure advocacy. But I mean, it, anyway, I think that as a journalist, what I found is that then people scrutinize my work in a way that they wouldn't scrutinize it because they know that I want to make it better for kids who are hurting. So I just have to be armed with a higher burden of proof than other journalists who are general assignment reporters who get the story wrong because they're not scared about nuance. They don't care about the um, empirical evidence that people like Jill and Eve are dealing with every day. They don't care about that other stuff it's to the same degree because, you know, the only thing you have, if you're trying to make change happen, only you have is truth and then but beyond that, all you have is reputation. So the second, you know, they see through that, you're just kind of like peddling something. You're in trouble. But, but the problem, is, I mean, is, I mean, on the advocacy thing, it, it was never that clear cut to me because the department was at fault. There were so many people at fault. If I wasn't advocating for anybody, I was just sort of shining a big light around and saying, "Look, look what, look what I found." Right. And uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> but at the bottom of it, I mean, what drove me was the, the, the safety of children. But you know, the department's a problem. The, the board of supervisors a problem. Cops are a problem. I mean, I mean, poverty. You know, it's, it's just all over the place. So right. And I just wanted people to know. You know where their tax dollars are going, and it wasn't working real well. And what if you appreciated that people stood up and did something because of the stories? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. But I can't go in with that as a as a goal because my, my life, I just, my, I would, I would just, that, that never happens. You know, I mean, it rarely happens that any social changes happens as a result of your stories. So. <laughs> uh, I, mean, that's true. I mean, if you think about it, wait a second, let's, let's, let's examine whether or not that's true. You were writing about this huge surge in, yeah. in um, but in, I don't um, think we, we no, stopped it. you didn't, well, I mean, it was that, it was, it was, it was all about, pardon? It peaked in 2000. It peaked in 2000, but it was a large reaction to stories like that, I think. I mean, that they start, they started working really hard on these TDMs and all these different team decision me me meetings where you have, you have different stakeholders around a child to try to find a different, and this is something Jill knows way more about than I do, but all about trying to get kids not in straight up foster care places. So there was a reaction. And you know, and it's all kind of in a continuum. So I don't know. But I, yeah, but I don't think you could place a, you know, say, you know, one percent of the reaction came from chronic disease. So I you know, I just I'm not sure. I don't know. It's part of the whole yeah, it's confluence a, of yeah, it's a Chair. Well, I was going to ask Jill and Edie, is there an analogy to be drawn with social welfare research? Because you're doing this research and you need to be very, you're trying to be objective, but at the same time you want social change. Mm -hmm. um, and so it sounds very similar, just for the social welfare students in the room, to how do you kind of deal with that kind of, so how do you walk that delicate line? Uh, I don't think the line is that all that delicate in research. I wear different hats at different, different days of the week. So how people perceive me might be a delicate line. But what I do on a Monday, as an example, might be very different than what I do on a Tuesday. So on a Monday, which would never happen, but if I had a Monday, <laughs> just do one thing, which would be my peer researcher. 
then, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a study right now. I'm doing a study where I'm trying to figure out whether a particular program for foster kids called CASA works, whether it actually has any benefits for kids. I don't know. I mean, it might, but it might not. And it might be, be no better than just having kids do regular services. I really don't know. I really don't know. And I'm doing that study. Randomized clinical trial will have controlled experimental conditions. In the end, I'll see what the data tell me. If the data tell me, gee, Katsu really isn't any better than just not on my pasta, then I'll be like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> better think it's something else to do, because that one's not giving us the bigger, the big benefit that we want. And I would be okay, I'd be okay with that because there's so much that we don't know that if we can find out that something really isn't doing much, then let's put some resources where we can get a bigger effect. That's okay with me, right? So that would be my Monday job as a researcher, is to be very objective and to go, I don't know what works. Let me just find it out. Now on a Tuesday, I might be teaching you about child care policy, and you're going to kind of hear a point of view. Because <laughs> 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 in the policy world that I spend some of my time in, points of view matter, and ideology matter, and values matter, and those are the lifeblood of getting policy made in this country. And so you're going to hear a point of view from me which you might differ with. And I would hope that, in fact, we would engage in a discourse that would involve a contrarian perspective. And then on a Wednesday, I might not have enough it. Because I want my the world's conversation to be bigger than just me and my UC Berkeley community of wonderfully, wonderfully privileged, highly educated people. And I want to live only in that bubble. The bubble is too much bigger and the stakes are too high. So my Wednesday, I would wear a different hat. You probably call it an advocacy hat because it was about an op-ed saying, darn it, child poverty's not okay. I mean, this out of control is never okay, but I mean, this out of control is so not okay that we have to do something about it. So it's just about wearing different hats, so it's not a fine line at all. But I recognize that because I wore those three different hats, somebody from out there in the world might say, oh, that's that Barrett person. Is she that advocate or is she that researcher? What, what, what is she? That's the piece that I have to try to manage, and that's the hardest thing for me to manage, because I can't manage you. <laughs> Journalism is not research. Very interesting. Journalism is not research. We don't do that. Right? We don't, we're not subject to the human subjects stuff. We, you know, we, we're story <laughs> Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. a huge difference. We have a professor in our school, I think Amber, who always says to me, if I started my career again, I would be a journalist. Because there's too, it's so many constraints doing, um, especially if you're working with human subjects and low populations. Getting your studies through is very difficult. Um, but what I do see the similarity in terms of social work research and journalism is um, what the social welfare system gives you, um, you could say you get what you pay for, right? So the consumers of that system don't have a big voice. So any research you're doing, whether or not you decide CASA works for kids or doesn't work for kids, whether after school programs are better than uh, before school programs, whatever it is you're looking at, you're actually helping um, give a voice to the consumers. And journalism can do that as well. It may not be systematic research, but you are giving a voice to folks who uh, have to take the services given to them. It's the only option. Um, so. One of the reasons I want the journalism <coughs> students in this room is I want you to learn to be better researchers. And I'm hoping some of it rubs off <laughs> from the professionals who you're working with in this class. That, and they can become better storytellers because I think public health, social welfare, all these, these different disciplines want to be storytellers. Some of them want to be multimedia storytellers. Um, so you learn, you'll learn to be better researchers and they'll learn to be better storytellers. I think that'd be a pretty cool experiment. I think that should be our pattern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about the social change or how it's difficult to affect social change, it just made me think of an example that I think would be totally, to it's totally reasonable, um, like achievable, as there was recent, not so recently, but there was a series of stories around foster youth not being involved in their court hearings, and that led to a law that then said that foster youth had to be notified and had to be um, allowed to attend court. And so that's, you know, a small, policy change in theory, but it shows a different level of respect to the child, and to me that is a huge change in the dialogue around foster care and who, who these kids are looked at as. Are they constantly going to be victimized by the system, or do they get to have a say? 
Well, I mean, what you're talking about there is also like there are pinpointed opportunities, which is kind of what we've been really engaged in is finding opportunities where you can make the push the push the envelope when the time comes. So you come and you do your same journalistic stuff, but you're shining a light on something at the moment when it, it's hitting. So you know, right before AB 12 is about to pop, and we're about to push foster care to age 21 here. You know, I got as many journalists as I could, including myself, to produce lots of stories. I mean, I was doing like radio shows and stuff. I've never done radio like like we produce radio documentary. I don't know how. But you know, but you know, around transition age youth, and that that you know cascade of stories, I think becomes a part of that thing at pinpointed times. But that that you're talking about, Karen DeSaw's series, um, and she got access to the courts um, from the judge down in Santa Clara, and she did this thing, and that was a, a two or three years ago. Now there's this big conversation about presumptively opening the juvenile dependency courts, which for journalists could be a very exciting thing because it means you could go into a courtroom if the court was open. For kids, this is could be dangerous because members of the public could come in and and yeah, or or predators could come in or whatever. Or members of the journalism who don't want the rest of the world right. to know their story. So exactly, and this is one of the ethical things, and we've got Eve here who knows a lot about ethics and is it into ethics. So um, you know, so but we're gonna really delve into this et ethical thing. And right now I've got a, a, a second year student from Harvard Law School looking at presumptively open courts around the country, what the danger, what the bad and good has been with the media covers that ensued. And then she's gonna be working up a code of ethics, which is something I'm gonna want all of you guys to add feed, feedback into. And you know, if we get that code of ethics out there, maybe we can raise the bar of journalists going into those courts. Wendy, you can shake your head. But you know, these are these are things we can try. So but I think it's I think it's a great point that there are pinpointed moments when the right coverage can really be the kicker and turn some, which is which is also very exciting if you're a journalist. I mean, I don't know. I get excited when that happens. I'm curious, do you see this in a, in a way from from what I understand sometimes journalists Look at kind of uh, public relations PR, as where you, it's not necessarily a friend. Then you're kind of doing advocacy for an organization, you're doing your communication. But in a way, it's, it is doing public relations for a cause. You're, you're going out and you're looking at communication more broadly to push an issue forward. Um, do you see that as, as something that this kind of work as being a way to kind of look at communications, uh, journalism that are wider than that communications to push forward? I mean, I think that again, that goes to like a broader thing, right? Which is this idea that we kind of harken to a little bit of the public intellectual, right? Where, you know, if you've got something important to say that will impel positive change, and you have this multitudinous ways of doing as much, it kind of behooves you to do that. I was talking to two guys, economists from NYU at some party, and they were talking about like our version of what like free market capitalism is. And I told them, I think this is what the public discourse is on that. Like, oh, you're totally wrong. Like, you have no idea. And I'm like, well, why do you guys, why, why do we not hear anything different? Because nobody's putting that out there. So whatever the cause is, I think if everybody could use a little bit of journalistic skill and objectivity in their storytelling, and really understood that they can't, when they start blasting one way or the other too much, I think that we'd have a better world, I think. And that may sound cheesy, but I think. It, just about public relations people, there are really fabulous ones out there, and there are, you know, just like in any profession, yeah. anyway, there are shills, and there are honest people, and you learn to find the honest people and work with them, and they are can be as more committed to good journalism than some journalists. So, yeah, I, I, I'm really careful to pick and choose on, on the on, on public information officers. Some of them incredibly committed public servants in, and uh, remarkable. And, uh, and great sources. Particularly when we're talking about somebody else's agency. <laughs> Actually, I think I've, you just used the word objectivity, which is, you know, big buzzword for journalists. Well, how, how would you, any of you, think about what is the role or function of objectivity in a project like this? I'm a social worker, so I'm thinking advocacy in a very, I'm a social worker used to be a lawyer, so I'm thinking advocacy. <laughs> My story's told in the courtroom, you know, that story is clearly advocacy. Right? It's not objective necessarily. <laughs> you know, that's not my job. So what is the role of other to be in a project like this? How do you think about it? How about if we substitute uh, fairness for objectivity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, and, 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 and I think that deals with a lot of the issue. But I think I think that we're committed to we're committed to verification.
of our facts, yeah. right? Um, and we're, we're committed to treating people fairly and, and, uh, and being transparent about what we're doing. We tell people what we're doing when we're interviewing them. We're saying this is for stories for publication. We're, we're open with them. We, we, we do all of, all of those things. We have lists of these things over here. Um, but that, the, the objectivity is kind of a false thing to be chasing around because you, you'll never get there. Um, and and people throw it at us all the time. But we, can't, we know we can be fair. Right. Um, with a, but I'm, every, we, you know, if one of us stood in the middle of that space there and danced, you know, you'd get 45 different versions of what happened, and each of them would be pretty true. Um, so, and, with, and we can judge whether they were fair, but were they objective? Who knows? In incorporating research, as you mentioned, I think you have your hypothesis and your null hypothesis, what you know to be true, what you know not to be true, and you have to fight um, hard to look at both sides. You know, and I think we're definitely going to encourage rigor here in terms of we want you to believe what you're writing about and also look at the counter belief and make sure that you, you didn't just let your heart lead you when you're opening your eyes to the facts. Yeah, I think I think that there's a really important thing going forward for any of us, I think, is, is that everything comes down to trust, especially when you're in the public sphere. And the moment you're not trusted, it's all over. So to do that, you have to be really rigorous in your adherence to facts and fairness. So my usage of objectivity was in error. I agree. It was. But why I didn't mean to say objectivity. But I think um, it, it's true. I mean, you just you have such a high. If you're really serious about being effective, you have to come with the strongest set of facts you can get together. And if you can do that, you can be very, 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 very effective. And you could. And you have to report against yourself. And, yeah. You know, you've, you've, you've gone down this road, you've been studying foster care for three weeks, and you've got all these things that you think are true, and then go challenge every one of them and tear it apart and see if it really is true. Yeah. Um, kind of going along with that, the, might be a question that has no foundation, but um, in terms of the solution based focus, uh, is with the other activity piece. Can you talk a little bit more about how that will play into the course of discussion in this class and uh, how that's played into your work in the past and the solution focus, solution basis? Well, I, I mean, look, look I mean, uh, for instance, Joe wrote a book, Take Me Home, that used kind of almost a mixture of case study that was like journalism in a way, breaking down what was happening in a narrative format to kind of talk about your policy thoughts about solutions for making sure the kids found permanency, right? So I think at every step of the way as we move forward, we talk about child maltreatment. Okay, so there's clear indicators of child maltreatment, which Jill also writes about in her poverty being a, 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 a poverty being a, a, a public health crisis. So I think that at every step we should be looking for, to the degree possible, what's the solution as opposed to just the narrative of this being a problem. That's, I mean, that's, that's what I'm, when, I, when we talk about Isn't that kind of by, Definition, somewhat advocacy, like it, it removes the objectivity piece, right? Because we're we're kind of pushing an agenda somewhat, well, in, in a way that's like very much, I think, a valid way. <laughs> well, we also look at the journalism side. I, maybe the journalism students are sick of hearing this, but particularly multimedia is a is a solution <laughs> oriented medium, in a way, because it, it, if it, if it's good, it encourages conversation with the community. And to the extent we can do that and find solutions that way, I think that, that would be a good thing. I mean, sort of print journalism isn't so hot at that. That's, everybody's dropping it like a hot rock. So, um, but, but multimedia encourages, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of weird comments in the bottom of the stories. But if you're effective in doing this well, you'll, you'll, you'll encourage conversation in the community, which I think is really important in an issue like this. Yeah, and I think that, that, that it doesn't, look, I mean, we're just switching the paradigm a little bit. So it's not like we're saying this is the solution. How are we going to know? It's like CASA, I think CASA's great. I mean, I'm like, wow, these guys are going in advocating for kids, and, you know, they're doing, I, I think, wow, they're doing amazing things. But you're going to objectively, and maybe there's a different solution. So I think that we can discuss the solutions that are out there without necessarily saying, oh, this must happen. But you know, and again, if you're not nuanced and you don't take into account. But it's a, it's a solution and a conversation in itself. 
Well, I mean, maybe it is. Maybe a higher discourse, one that is trying to be pragmatic about fixing problems, is more the conversation we should have, and maybe that'll, maybe that'll help. Well, if we have, I'm oh, sorry, we have one question here, and then if you'd like to do as well, and then I think we're gonna wrap it up so we can do our kind of uh, introductions and final stuff for you guys. Yeah, we, and you guys are welcome to stick around for that, or leave. So you can listen to hear <laughs> all, these, all these great students that are, but I understand like, my Without these guys, none of this would be possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.